Thanks for that welcome. It's quite a crowd from up here. Um, it's good to see so many of you here. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be coming at this from my particular angle, uh, the, the angle of a, of a historian and a Greco-Roman historian at that. So an apology in advance for the, for the teachers. It won't be as applicable to your everyday work, but I'm, that will come later on in the conference as well. So my topic, reading with ancient eyes, children, households, and baptism in the first century. We all know by now there's no silver bullet when it comes to the debate about uh, infant baptism. It's been many years uh, since we've begun this debate. Can infants be baptized? Should infants be baptized? I wonder sometimes if we might not have more success if we poured our collective energies into devising a method for time travel. If we could somehow find Dr. Who's TARDIS or, or something of the sort and we could invite Albert Moeller Jr. and Alistair Begg and John Piper to travel with us to the first century to one of these moments in which a household was baptized, we could finally present them with definitive proof that there were infants in these first century households that were baptized. We wouldn't have to pick up people like Charles Spurgeon, of course, because he's already figured it out by now. The reason why I begin this way is because sometimes the debate has come down to uh, who can best imagine what went on in the first century when we read in these accounts and acts about households being baptized. One of the most prominent members on the, of the debate on the Baptist side was a man named George Beasley Murray. He tried his best to imagine children being baptized in these households and he failed. This is what he wrote, thinking of the baptism of the household of the Philippian jailer. In Acts 16 he wrote, it is nonsense to think that the infants were brought out of their beds at this early hour of the morning and listened to the instruction before being baptized. He figured it was complete nonsense to imagine this. The response of J.W. Scott was a practical one. He said he forgets that mothers are loath to leave their infants uh, unattended for any period of time and that Paul probably instructed the jailer to bring the entire household to the jail in anticipation of a household baptism. But my favorite response is by Watts, who said the following. He said, parents know all too well that there's nothing implausible about infants being up in the middle of the night. <laughs> Indeed. We're limited then in our ability to travel back in time. We can't travel back to the first century. We're limited also in our ability to imagine what happened on the ground in the first century, but we're not at a complete loss. And I don't think we should give up too quickly on these household baptism passages when it comes to considering our theology of baptism, considering also uh, the defense of infant baptism, which is so dear to our hearts. This morning, I'd like to answer this question and address this question. Were infants included in these household baptisms in the accounts in Acts from two different angles? First, we're going to look very closely at the narratives themselves to see what they say, and importantly, what they don't say in the course of these descriptions. We'll see that it makes a great deal how these passages were written in the original Greek. And we'll see how some translations have actually obscured the original Greek as well in an effort to perhaps close the door to infant baptism. Second, I'm going to ask the question, um, how did the first readers read these accounts? When somebody sat down for the first time or, or sat in, in Luke's audience as he, he orated this, this history of the Christian church, how did they receive these passages? What did they think when they heard about a household being baptized? That's why it's entitled Reading with Ancient Eyes. I want to take you back into the first century and try to get you some sense of what does it mean for a first century observer to hear about household baptisms? And so to answer that question, we'll spend some time considering the in integration of children in the first century household. Before getting going, though, I want to spend some time just looking at the evidence for actual baptisms in the first century, actual baptisms, sorry, in the New Testament. Even a quick survey will show just how important household baptisms were in the first century in the early church, and consequently how important they should be for us as we craft our understanding of the, the early Christian church. So our first slide then gives us 10 instances in which baptism is specifically mentioned, not, not in terms of the theology of baptism, but actual baptisms in the first century. The first one, of course, at Pentecost, when 3,000 men were baptized in Jerusalem. Then in chapter 8, there's a, a group of men and women, untold exactly how many, baptized in Samaria by Philip 
including the man Simon the Magician. In Acts chapter 8 as well, the Ethiopian eunuch is baptized by Philip. In Acts 9, the Apostle Paul himself is baptized. In Acts 10, we get the baptism of Cornelius, the uh, centurion and his household, or the Roman official. Acts 16, Lydia and her household, the same chapter, the Philippian jailer and his household. Acts 18, Crispus and his household. In 1 Corinthians, 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 16, Paul makes reference to having baptized Stephanus and his household. And finally, in Acts 19, uh, the disciples of John the Baptist are, are baptized when they, when they encounter the disciples and the, the news of, of Jesus Christ. Now, this quick summary of baptism in the first century, baptism in the early Christian church, reveals a startling detail. There are nine people specified as having been baptized, nine specific individuals, apart from these large groups of individuals, Simon Magus, Ethiopian eunuch, Paul, Cornelius, Lydia, Philippian jailer, Crispus, Stephanus, and these disciples. And of these nine individuals, five have their households baptized as well. More than 50% of those specific individuals who are mentioned as having been baptized have their households baptized as well. And that ought to tell us from the very beginning that we ought to pay careful attention to what's happening in these households and what's happening in these household baptisms. For that, we need to turn to the Greek text itself instead of translations, because as I said, the NIV translation obscures what's actually going on in the original Greek. The first place to stop is the baptism of Lydia and her household. There we read that when Lydia heard the Apostle Paul speaking, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. It's important to note that it's only her faith that is mentioned explicitly. The Lord opened her heart. Her household is baptized, but we hear nothing of the faith of those in the household. And her baptism as well, she is baptized, and her household is associated with her in that baptism. The verb there, if you can follow the Greek, is in the singular. She was baptized. And then there's this phrase, kaiho oikos autes, which is sort of a formula saying, and her household along with her. They are associated with her in her baptism. The NIV makes it a plural verb and turns it into something which the Greek does not. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. But, but Luke is very precise in the way that he mentions exactly what happened there. Lydia is the one whose heart was opened to the gospel, and then Lydia was baptized, and her household was baptized along with her. They were baptized by virtue of the fact they were in the household. Lydia was baptized on the basis of her profession of faith. The importance of this careful use of language is even clearer from the next passage, which is of the Philippian jailer, a more lengthier passage. First of all, we can note the promise that goes out to the Philippian jailer underlined there. Uh, he asks the important question, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And they say to him, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe in the Lord Jesus is a singular command. It's made to the Philippian jailer. There's a singular verb there, not a plural verb. The, the, the words, you will be saved as well, are singular verbs. They are addressed to the Philippian jailer. The, the promise comes to the Philippian jailer as the head of the household, and through him it is, it is extended to the household as well. The focus is on the jailer, very clearly, with the way that the apostle, or the way that Luke has crafted his narrative. And then the household is associated with him in that promise. The same goes for the account of his household baptism. It says in the same way as with Lydia, he was baptized at once. Again, a, a, a verb in the singular. He was baptized at once. He and all his family, his household is associated in his baptism. But perhaps the most important thing to notice is when it comes to the testimony of faith. He rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Singular verb. Note the NIV at the bottom of the screen there. If you jump to the bottom there, they've changed it around. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. And it takes the he and his whole household and it applies it to his profession of faith. 
because he had come to believe in God, you get the impression perhaps the entire household also came to faith in God. But the Greek is very specific. The Greek says the Philippian jailer came to faith and his household shared in his joy, not necessarily in his faith. So in the, in the Greek, it's very clear the jailer receives all the attention. It's not to say, of course, that no one in the household believed. That's not what I'm trying to suggest here this morning. But the point is that Luke is not concerned about the faith of those members of the household. He's concerned that this householder, the, the, the head of the household, professed faith in Christ Jesus. And because he professed faith in Christ Jesus, the members of his household received the same promise of salvation and received the same sign of the promise, baptism. The same pattern we can see in the final account of Crispus. There's no uh, uh, reference to specifically his household being baptized, but you see the same thing with regard to his testimony of faith. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord. Again, singular verb. He believed in the Lord together with his whole, his entire household. Again, they're associated with him in some way with his profession of faith. The grammatical construction remains the same, even though the vocabulary is is slightly different. There's precision in Luke's language in attributing faith to the head of the household. And he's not concerned at all to consider whether or not those members of the household themselves expressed a a profession of faith at the same time. What this consistent pattern suggests is that a, a profession of faith was necessary for the head of the household. But when it came to the members of the household, They were baptized, they were received into the covenant community simply by virtue of their membership within the household. They received the sign just like they received the promises through the head of the household. What can we say? We can say anyone who belongs to a household can be baptized. Anyone who belongs to a household of faith, that is anyone who belongs to a household in which the head of the household professes faith in Christ Jesus, ought to receive the sign of baptism. And since household baptism, as we've seen, is the predominant way in which baptism was extended in the first century church, at least according to the account of Acts, we can say safely that there must have been many infants who were baptized in the first century as well. But is that only our assumption? That's the question I want to deal with now. Is this the same kind of assumption anybody in the first century would have made coming into the text for the first time? reading of the account of these household baptisms. That's the question I want to turn to next. In this quest connection, I want to ask a question of the ancient world. Was it possible for a householder to have authority in this way for his entire household to be brought into a different uh, religion, if you could say that? Did the householder, in particular the father of a household, did he have that kind of power? Well, it turns out to be an easy question to answer. The, the Roman householder, the head of the household, had legendary power over the people in his household. The patrifamilias, as they called him, the father of the family, had what's called patria potestas, a power over his household that is unparalleled, you could say. In our context, we have people asserting the equal rights of children, so much so that children need to be able to identify themselves in terms of their gender, and we need to respect that. Um, unthinkable in the, in the ancient world. The, the Roman householder's control over those who are members of his family was almost absolute. In fact, have a look at this quote by Dionysius of Halicarnassus, a Greek historian of the first century. He wrote about the distant legendary past of, of Rome, but Romulus, the lawgiver of the Romans, gave virtually all power to the father over his son, even during his whole life whether he thought proper to imprison him, to scourge him, to put him in chains, and to keep him at work in the, f- in the fields, or to put him to death. In particular, this right over the life of the child. This was the, the common Roman perception that the householder had the right over the very life of his children. This is a legendary account, but we can turn to a more reliable source in the jurist Gaius, who sort of assembled all sorts of Roman laws a little later on in the Roman Empire. And this was what he had to say about the pater familias. There are hardly any other men who have over their children a power such as we have. So when it came to outside observers, this idea that the head of the household, that this father had the authority to have all of his children or all the members of his household, in fact, baptized, would not have been a surprise in the very least. In fact, it would have been much to be expected. 
also for the reasons I want to show you now. And this, this has to do with the evidence for the place religion, children had in their religious life of the household. We can start with a very intriguing um, moment in the life of a child. The so-called dies lustricus, or the day of purification. I say intriguing because there's not much that's known about it, but the details that we do have provide us with a, a really interesting parallel to infant baptism. This day of purification, as it says on the slide, it took place on the ninth day after birth for um, boys, eighth day for girls, and it signified the formal initiation of a child into the family. The child was born, and, and very shortly thereafter, there was this moment, this special day, on a set day for every household in the, in, the, in the Roman world, in which the child would be welcomed into the family. It was the child, you could call it, a social birth, the social birth of the child. But more important for our purposes is, is to note that in the ancient world, you couldn't separate out things like social life, uh, political life, religious life. It was all one and the same. In fact, many scholars have given to completely abandoning those kind of categories when it comes to describing first century life. You can't even talk about religion in the first century, they say, because it was so embedded in, in first century society. So when a child was initiated into the family, it wasn't just a social thing, it wasn't just a, a family thing, it was a religious event. And so there's offerings to the gods that take place in these moments, there's a ritual purification that takes place in this moment. There's all sorts of religious rituals that attend this dies lustricus, this day of purification. And so in a contest like this, it's not difficult for a first reader to, to read Luke's account of these households being baptized and to imagine that infants as well are initiated in this way into the Christian church, are initiated in this way into the covenant community. In fact, it may even be that these observers are using this as a filter or a lens through which to view Christian baptism. They say, oh yes, we have something similar in our own practice. We have some kind of uh, ritual even including purification and, and water perhaps uh, that might help us understand. What's more interesting even is this suggestion by one scholar, um, intriguing anyway. She writes this about this special day. It's likely that memory of the Dies Lustricus was preserved by adults and older child attendees who may have reminded younger family members of their Dies Lustricus at other gather uh, gatherings, such as birthdays, coming of age ceremonies, betrothals, and weddings. That's an intriguing suggestion, I say, because isn't that just what we do with our children, with our covenant children, remind them of their baptism at various moments in their life, remind them that they are covenant children. And so we have in the Roman household these parents or perhaps siblings reminding the child of that moment which they don't remember, but that moment in which they were also introduced into the religious life of the household. And so what we can say already now is to say that baptism would not have stood out, baptism of infants, sorry, would not have stood out to those first century readers. As they came through the, 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 the narrative account in, in Acts, and they came across these accounts of households being baptized, they wouldn't have taken a step back and think, what's, what's this funny business that is going on here in, in the Christian church? Um, it would have been expected, even. So much for their initiation. What happened after they were born? What happened after they grew up? What happened? Did they join in in the ritual life of the household? The first thing to note is that children were expected to follow in the way of their parents. If your parents were uh, worshiping these gods, you were expected to worship the same gods as your parents. One of the most fun foundational Roman virtues was pietas, piety. And piety had to do in particular with following ancestral traditions, following the traditions of your fathers and your grandfathers. There's this sense in which there's a time-honored religious practice that goes on through the generations. And each household had its particular gods and goddesses to worship, particularly tied to that specific household. You had the genius uh, who was associated with the master of the house. Every household had a genius. The Juno was associ associated with the mistress of the house. Every household had a Juno. And then you had the Panates, the gods of the storeroom. You had Vesta, the goddess of the hearth. You had the Lares, who were the guardian deities. Each household would have these same gods, and yet each one was particular to each household as well. There was a way in which you had a particular ritual 
uh, life to your particular household. You worshipped your own household gods. In addition to these common gods, there were any number of other ones. So when a child was welcomed into the family, when a child was initiated in this day of purification, he was welcomed into a, a complex religious life as well. A religious life that had been established by his paterfamilias, the father of the family, but also by the ancestors in, in the past. The idea was that you inducted yourself or you became inducted into an existing, an existing pattern. Have a look, for example, at um, this advice of Plutarch in the first century, a Roman writer, to a woman. This is advice to a bride and groom. And he writes this, a woman ought not to make friends of her own, but to enjoy her husband's friends in common with him. The gods are the first and most important friends. Hence it is becoming for a wife to worship and to know only the gods that her husband believes in and to shut the door tight upon all strange rituals and outlandish superstitions. For with no gods do stealthy and secret rites performed by a woman find any favor. This is dealing with the the wife or the, the mistress of the household, but saying there needs to be absolute loyalty when it comes to her religious practices and the religious practices of the, the head of the household, of her husband. It's even clearer in this account from Cicero in the first century BC, who writes this, he's, ta- he's describing the ideal state, uh, the ideal political um, scenario. He says, let no one have gods of their own, neither new ones nor from abroad, unless introduced to Rome publicly. Let their private worship be for those gods whose worship they have duly received from their fathers. Let them preserve the rituals of their families and of their fathers. So according to the Romans, children belonged in the ritual life of the household. Actually, I I should state it even more strongly. In, In Roman eyes, it was absolutely disastrous for children to go their own way or for children not to be included in the religious rituals of the household. Now, what does all this mean? I can hear some of you thinking, who cares about history? Before I answer that question, I have one more piece to add to this mental picture in your minds. I want to ask another question. How did these outside observers look at the Jewish household in particular, especially when it came to including children? Christianity was, of course, new on the scene when it came to uh, the first century. But many of these readers, these first readers, were familiar with Jewish households. In fact, many of them were God-fearers. That is, they were attached to the synagogue in some way. They were familiar with the way that Jewish households worked. So they had ample opportunity to witness what life in the Jewish household was like. So what did they see when it came to their Jewish neighbors? The boring answer is not much different from other families, actually. It turns out that Jewish families were very similar in, in many respects from other households. But obviously that's not the only thing to say because otherwise I wouldn't still be standing here. Where Jews were remarkable, it seems, was in the way they included children and prioritized children in their households in the first century. For, for one, the Romans themselves observed that Jews, unlike anybody else in the first century, refused to abort children. They refused also to practice exposure, which was the practice of after birth, taking a child, an unwanted child and simply leaving him on the local garbage heap. They refused to practice this, and outside observers like Tacitus, a Roman historian, noted this of the Jews. In fact, he said that's the reason why their population is, is out of control. And so it's not surprising when we turn to everyone's favorite historian, the Jewish writer Josephus, um, we see him highlighting just this. He writes a book called, or a work called Against Appian, And in this work against Appian, he's concerned to defend the Jewish character, the Jewish um, nature. The the sole purpose of this work is is for him to exalt the Jewish character and exalt the nature of the Jewish people in defense against all these accusations. So he's going to highlight everything that's good about, about the Jewish people. And the thing that he chooses to highlight there are the following. He writes, first of all, above all, we take pride in raising children saying, listen, um, all you haters out there, uh, one of the best things about the Jewish household is that we, we take great pride in the way that we raise our children. Later on, he makes it even more explicit, and he refers to this practice, practice of infanticide. He says, the law gave orders to nurture all children, 
and prohibited women from causing the seed to miscarry and from destroying it. But if it were to become evident, she would be an infanticide, obliterating a soul and diminishing the human race. So he, he says, listen, uh, again, we are people who take special care of our children. Even the unborn children are of great concern to us, uh, unlike you others who, who practice infanticide. And then he extols their practice of, of raising children in the customs of the household from the very beginning. Indeed, he says, not even on the occasion of the birth of children, again, taking things to the very beginning, not even on the occasion of the birth of children did it permit laying on feasts and making pretexts for drunkenness. But it ordered that from the very beginning, their upbringing should be in sober moderation. So he's saying to his audience again, he's saying, listen, the, the way that the Jewish people treat their children is that from the very beginning of their life, they are concerned to raise them in, in sort of the good way, in the ways of, and he'll explain later, in the ways of Moses, in the laws of Moses. What's the point here? When Josephus wants to win the sympathy of, the, of his readers, when he wants to build on the reputation of his fellow Jews, he chooses the way that they treat their children as a way of, of bolstering their, their public reputation. He says, in fact, that they care more for children than their Gentile neighbors. You look at the Roman households, um, they care for their children in such a way, we do an even better job. Um, they are even more special and integrated than in their Gentile neighbors. What does all this mean? Maybe some of you have come to your own conclusions already, but some of you may be wondering what this has to do with the place of children in the church today, what it has to do with the baptism of infants in the households in the book of Acts. I'll start by asking my questions again. What went through the minds of the first readers when they read about these household baptisms? What were they thinking? What presuppositions, what established thoughts did they bring to the text? And how did that inform the way that they received Luke's message? The evidence that I've just shown you, and there's more, I had to cut some out, even though I, I guess I've got more time than I, than I thought I did. Um, the evidence suggests that they would have expected children to simply follow in the way of the head of the household in terms of religious practices. What's more, they wouldn't have been surprised by infants undergoing some kind of rite of initiation, some kind of entry into the religious life of the household. In fact, given their own experiences, that would have been their expectation that the Christians would do sort of the same kind of thing as they were doing. And all this leads me to say this thing, that the silence in our text is deafening. Arguments from silence, if you've done any work in sort of, uh, in, in rhetoric, you know, are not the strongest arguments, or at least people will, will attack them, and yet they have a place, arguments from silence, because some silence speaks very loudly. What silence are we talking about here? We're not talking about the silence of the fact that there's no infants mentioned in these baptisms, which is what the Baptist commentators would like to point out every time. There's no specific mention of an infant being baptized in the accounts in Acts. Do we need a specific mention? The deafening silence, for me, is the absence of any kind of explanation by Luke to both Jews and to non-Jews alike that unlike every other household, in the ancient world, the Jews denied full inclusion of their children when it came to household religion. If children were denied the sacrament of baptism, maybe that's putting it too combatively, if children were not permitted uh, the baptism, the sacrament of baptism, then, then Luke simply could not have written simply that the Philippian jailer was baptized along with his household. If children were not permitted the sacrament of baptism, then Luke could not have written that Lydia was baptized along with her household, or that the household of Crispus, or that the household of Stephanus was baptized along with them. Surely Luke would have had, said, had to say something like this to his readers. Contrary to your expectations, when I say the household was baptized, I mean only those in the household who could make a credible profession of faith. He couldn't simply say to a first century reader, the household was baptized. Even in certain occasions, the whole household or the entire household was baptized. But he doesn't. He doesn't give any kind of qualification. He doesn't give any kind of explanation. And that silence, I submit to you, speaks much louder 
than the absence of any specific reference to infants. He doesn't need to mention infants because the presupposition and the assumption was there. An argument from silence, yes, but make no mistakes, there's silence on both sides of the debate. To the Baptists, we can ask, where are the professions of faith of the other members of the household? Just one. Sh show me one profession of faith of these other members of the household. Why is Luke so precise in the way that he formulates these accounts? Why is he so precise in identifying the, the faith of the householder and then having this particular way of including the, the, the household indirectly with that baptism? And how can we eliminate the possibility that there are infants in these households if Luke gives us no warrant to do so? Households in the ancient world included children. Sure, there were some that did not include children, but that's not an assumption you could make on the basis of simply the word household. So it's not a question of whether or not an argument from silence is valid. It's a question of which silence speaks louder. Luke has written about household baptisms with no clarifying words whatsoever. And he writes these words in two contexts. The first context is the canonical context. Within the context of Scripture, Luke presents us with something that looks very familiar. We'll probably hear more of that later. He pre presents us with something that looks very familiar to the Old, con the Old co Testament. It looks like Genesis 17, doesn't it? When Abraham circumcises his entire household, including Isaac, on the eighth day, but also so many others of that household as well. It's not surprising when we come to Acts, if we've been reading scripture all along, and we read of a household being baptized. That's the first context, but the second context is this. It's the historical context. That in the context of Jewish households and in the context of Greco-Roman households, we see the same kind of tradition and the same kind of practice. Children belong. Children have a place in the religious life of the household. In fact, they are fully included in the religious life of the household. And so they belong in the church as well. Thank you.